Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, I'd like to thank Citrus as well for inviting me to give this, uh, this seminar today. So um, when I spoke to Shankar about this as to, you know, what's, what's the target audience as it were? So um, I was supposed to give two seminars. One was a, a technical seminar on Tuesday. And um, he said, keep the, the one on Thursday uh, sort of more general, as it were. And uh, unfortunately, the one on Tuesday was canceled for unforeseen circumstances. And as an academic, I can't uh, resist the temptation to, to, to add a few more sort of technical slides in here and you know, you know, have a few graphs and various other things. But I'll resist sort of using them. So let's see how it goes. But um, I'll, I'll try and... Um, what I'll try and do is to give you an overview of the work um, and then also give you some of the in intuition behind some of the decisions which were made, why were they made, uh, etc. So, so we are a five university consortium um, based in Scotland and we're also multidisciplinary. I'm a computer sci scientist myself from the School of Informatics but I close w work closely with electronic engineers um, and device physicists and even electrochemists, and I will see the reason why it's important to work in this sort of multidisciplinary, sort of integrated fashion. Okay. So <coughs> here's an overview of the talk. I'll say something about uh, spec, spec nets, and spec computing. You know, why is it important that we look at some of the issues that we do here, um, i.e., sort of looking beyond traditional wireless sensor networks, um, and then I will. Um, pick out three three examples of uh, of of work. One is the almost an application layer work, which is distributed sensing for wireless sourceless motion tracking and the motion tracking of humans, whereby you put these uh, um, spec devices on the person and be able to track the the, the movement of the limbs, for instance. You know? So that's uh, that's one application which I'll talk about. Um, Next, I sort of picked up uh, something which is algorithmic, um, which is a distributed leaderless localization algorithm, um, um, which might be of interest to people. And the third one is going one level lower to the, to, to the sort of uh, bottom of the, the stack, the MAC layer, the medium access control layer, and say something about spec MAC, which, uh, um, and, um, make comparisons with Berkeley Mac and uh, some of the results show that we outperform Berkeley Mac by orders of magnitude and that's uh, quite quite heartening to say that in Berkeley so I thought I should say that and then I'll conclude with some uh, um, with some slides so I'm going to skip these slides uh, because that sets the scenario it's in the interest of time so the banner headline as it were for for the research is to design and realize these programmable semiconductor devices which can sense computer network wirelessly. So that's a banner headline. And uh, the size of these things, we want them to be small. Um, we call them five cube, five by five by five millimeters, which includes the, the battery as well. And I'll show you the first prototype of this one. Um, as I said, it's still in the lab. Um, We're still getting it to work, as it were, but I, I have some some pictures for you to show. Um, the, given the sizes um, of these devices and given the limited power, we are thinking in terms of communication which is not over a kilometer or, or even tens of meters, but is over a few centimeters to say 10 meters at the most. Um, so it's short range communication and the kinds of networks that we are, are looking at is quite dense networks, okay, with a high density in there. And the vision is that uh, you can buy specs by the weight, where you might have a, a yellow spec which has everything else is the same, but it has a different um, sensor, say a temperature sensor, or you have something else with uh, a pressure sensor on it. The idea being that you need the mixture of these two sensing devices in order to implement a certain application, which requires, say, temperature sensing and pressure sensing in it. Okay. And then we assume uh, a priori that these, this, these specs are, are non-static, that is, they could move around, not by their own locomotion, but rather they could be on the person, on their hands. For instance, if I were to wave my hands around, 
there is sort of relative motion between the specks on my hand and the ones on my torso, for instance. Okay? And we also assume a priori that they are unreliable. And that's an important assumption to make because uh, you'd be using these things in hostile environments, or the, the way that you manufacture them, um, you'd be manufacturing them in, in bulk, as it were, and you won't be able to test each one of them individually. So one of the, one of the things that you would do when you get the specs is to find which ones work and form a network, as it were, from the ones which do. And even when they do work, they could go down for a number of reasons, or even the communications could be in, uh, intermittent. For instance, they could be in range, out of range, and lots, whole loads of issues. So we think in terms of a, of a network with a certain half-life, as it were. You know, as over time, as you lose the specs, um, the quality of service goes down, and you need to sort of maintain essential services, as it were, in, in the light of these things. So, I mean, these are issues that you need to incorporate right from the start, because uh, if you want to deploy them in anger, these are the kinds of issues that you need to deal with. And you can have tens, if not hundreds, or even thousands of these uh, specs to collaborate as dense programmable networks. Scalability is a big issue. So the kinds of algorithms that we work on are fully decentralized, leaderless algorithms, which need to degrade gracefully as some of these specs go down. And these programmable networks, again, the, the emphasis there is on the programmability aspect of this. You know, you can hardwire all these functions onto these specs, but we want to come up with a platform where you can actually uh, program various behaviors, various applications onto this. So, um, so we call that as the, as the spec net. And the idea is that you have individual specs with sensors on them, and then they sense locally data, and this data is processed locally. And then you share some of the uh, partial information that you extract with your neighboring specs in order to extract information globally, as it were. So um, in essence, what is happening is you're, you, are, um, you are extracting information in situ. So you have there is a whole body of work in sort of distributed computation, but what you have is fine-grained distributed computation on a platform which is, um, which, is, um, which is constrained in terms of resources, in terms of memory in each of these specs, in terms of the power which is available in each of these specs. Okay, so it's a highly, highly kind of resource-constrained platform on which you need to, to do these things. So the comparison I would make is with the with the microprocessor 35 or 40 years back, what the microprocessor did was you were able to encapsulate processing and storage on a single chip. So you could take a large box of electronics and replace that with a single microprocessor. And you can have different behaviors on the microprocessor by sort of programming them. So what we are moving towards is a platform, a network of these specs called SpecNets, which is a programmable platform, the idea being for different classes of problems, if you have different sensors on them, you want this to be a platform for uh, ubiquitous of pervasive computing uh, for those classes of applications. And very importantly, where size matters. Because we want to make this small, you want to be able to uh, sort of treat the classes of problems where you couldn't reach computation or where you couldn't reach sensing or you couldn't even reach wireless networking to those parts. So the idea being that you can open up entirely new classes of problems. So um, in what way are we looking beyond traditional sensor networks? So I will sort of draw out a few of these things. Um, traditional sensor networks tend to be data-centric for good reason, the idea being that you have sensors and you're able to sense the data and transmit the data to a central host where all the processing took place and you made decisions, et cetera. Whereas what we want to be is more program-centric, where the behavior which runs on a central host in the traditional sensor networks actually runs on the, uh, on the devices themselves. So in a sense, what you're doing is you're pushing the, the intelligence, as it were, in inverted commas, towards the, towards the edges. And rather than sparse networks, as you traditionally have in sensor networks, we're looking at dense networks, which so short-range communication. We assume that uh, a priori that the, the nodes are mobile, so you're thinking in terms of all the, uh, all the 
issues and uh, relevant to mobile ad hoc sensor networks, as it were. Okay, mobile ad hoc networks in terms of in terms of uh, routing data, etc. Okay, and the data transfer model in a traditional sensor networks, and you have these source nodes, and you transfer to a to a sync node. Whereas the kind of model that we're looking at is a more peer-to-peer -peer model in the spec net, where each of these specs have sensors in them, they have storage, they have processing, they have wireless networking, and you could be using different aspects of these um, of these various capabilities depending on the needs, and this need can change over time, and you're able to adapt accordingly. Okay, so it's a far more flexible, adaptive model that you have compared to traditional sensor networks. And very importantly, the control model, and I'll show you um, a couple of examples of this, is fully decentralized and, uh, and leaderless. Okay, so we have different classes uh, of these specs, and what you see on the top left-hand corner is, is similar to your, that's a programmable platform based on PSOC from, from Cypress. So that, you might say, is similar to your moats and one on the right-hand side has a 32-bit ARM processor in there. So you, may, you can imagine that to be um, a kind of a microserver for a collection, a network of these uh, smaller specs. And um, what you have on the right-hand side is something called Orion 2, which has a particular set of sensors that we found quite useful, which are the three-axis magnetometers, the three-axis gyro, and three-axis accelerometer. And there is a whole host of uh, um, sort of uh, applications that one can address using those. And what you see in the middle is the, is the five cube version of this. Um, and I'll sort of come back to that. And then we have these large platforms, a 64 node test bed, which is used to, to run, say, routing problems, etc. in the real, where you run them in simulations uh, at the packet level. But then you want to, want, want to run these algorithms on actual processes, and we use that as a means. And the way it's uh, set up, it's instrumented to give you all the power information, et cetera, um, on the fly, as it were. Okay? And that can be accessed over the internet, in case people are interested. In. And this is the 5-cube. We call it the 5-cube OTS, because one of the things that we are looking at to start with is seeing using dyes from, uh, from sort of industrial manufacturers. For instance, we get the radio dye uh, from a radio manufacturer. We get the... Uh, processor dive from a processor manufacturer and the various sensor onto it and be able to take care of all the issues of flip chip bonding and being able to get the, the batteries in, etc. And the idea being that any problems that you might have with packaging can actually inform the design, the custom design of these various radios and the processors, etc. Okay, so that's why. The idea being that you take each one of these components out and replace them with uh, custom design ones. So that's how you manage complexity in a large project, as it were. Okay? And, um, and then we come to, so I've told you about specs, I've told you about spec nets, and we come to speckled computing. The idea being that uh, we need to look at new models of unencumbered interaction with the digital world. When you think in terms of interaction with the digital world, you think in terms of a, a mouse or a joystick or, your, um, or even the, the QWERTY keyboard that you have here. But in the future, if you can bring out the interaction to the physical world, as it were, by, for instance, one way of doing that is to um, have the physical world as the primary site of interaction, and you have these various specs in the body, and you be able to interpret the various gestures that you make with the body. So you, know, you, can, you can think in terms of new ways in which to interact with the, with the digital world. So there are three ways in which I would... Um, I would sort of go through this and say, if you, for instance, if you were to have, say, SpecNet on the person, say, say a dancer, okay, um, what you can do is use it as a traditional sensor network. In other words, you're getting information such as the speed of rotation, the number of revolutions per minute, etc., and be able to put that onto um, onto a screen, and we did that, and there is a video, but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that. Okay, that's the most exciting part of the talk, actually, the video and break dancers. Where you put them on break dancers, they're spinning on their heads, as you can see the, the graphics there, and then you can put up information as to how fast are they rotating, the idea being that you can have... Uh, you want to see it? Please. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. 
so right I was I was going to skip it so I kind of uh, I don't know where I put yes you'll f I'll show you the golf afterwards um, one second uh, it's not the full where is the breakdown um, okay I wanted a short breakdown but I'll show you the long one all the same um, there is a breakdance cut which I'm looking for. I put them all on the on the screen. Okay, can I do this right at the end? Because I'll definitely show it to you. Oh, okay, L let me do the let me do the breakdance because it's quite long. I don't know uh, whether. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are we ready with the specs? Yeah, we're going. Okay, go. this was in a in a science Houston. exhibition so where we had breakdance having the specs in the, the corner. Okay, so that's what's that um, measure yeah. yeah, so people, 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 There is a so shorter version. Here, this is a number that's going up and down. You can see the compass there as well. That's the red thing there. So if you want to start a spin, boys, and then we can see the waves on the screen. Wow. See okay, you get a picture. Sort of it's a competition between two breakdancers as to who can, who can spin the fastest on his head. Okay. Um, you should look at the RPM count. Um, but I tell you, this is, this is the unedited version, and I think in the interest of time, we should skip this. And, but you get a picture as to what, is, uh, what you're trying to do there. Okay. So that is using the, the network in a traditional sort of... Uh, sense of network fashion. But you can get one step further and said, okay, I, I put the same thing, but I have not one, but I have a network of these things. And in this case, uh, you have Alex, who's my grad student, and he has four of these uh, t uh, on his arms, and he's able to sort of move the arms around. And as you can see, it's well, in September 2005, it's almost 18 months old. And what you see there is, 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 a, is he's able to sort of track the movement, but it's not very smooth, and uh, and you know it's sensitive, but not very smooth. So, so what you're doing here is moving towards speckled computing because each one of these sensors senses data locally. It does local processing, and what sends to the outside world is summaries of information as to where where it lies. So, there's local processing. There is uh, um, there is there is coordination because there is communication between them, and you're solving a global problem. In this case, it's uh, trying to track the movements of human limbs. And it gets better, and this is after 12 months, why we've added a gyro to that. Previously, it was only accelerometer and magnetometers. And it has a, not a CSMA protocol, but a TDMA protocol running on it. And uh, we have up to 15 devices for full human tracking. But um, you can see that um, he's doing quite well. So I'm going to skip this and go on to the next one, because what this has is an entire 15 devices okay, on the person, the on and it can track the full human body as it feels. So, you see, I've got two arms and two legs, and I can happily walk around the room. And you're doing this in real time. And there are 64 updates per second on each device. So you're doing better than real time, as it were. So this is tracking only using the gyros. That's the tell will turn off. So you go out of the lab and then come back in so you can still track him as, as you're doing. And um, as far as you know, this is the first and only wireless miniature tracking for the entire human body that we've come up with. Okay, so, so that is sort of full body tracking using these, um, which is getting towards the concept of spec computing where you are doing things at the edges and, not, and all you're sending to the, um, to the outside world is the positions over time which gets uh, updated. And now we can go one step further and uh, you can start 
uh, not only having sensing and processing and local networking, but you can also have actuation because then you can have a robot here and, um, which has specs on them um, and then you are performing the inverse kinematics on it. As you are performing certain actions, you can get the robot to mimic those actions. Okay? So that brings in actuation in there as well. Okay, so the hardware is custom designed, and uh, that's the size. That includes the battery, which is on the, um, on the other side, as it were. And it's a 16-bit microchip DSP PIC processor. Um, it's got a chip con radio. Previously, we had a 2.4 uh, gigahertz radio on that, a Zigbee-style radio, but we found that uh, going down in frequency, um, the, there's less absorption of these things in the body, etc. cetera. Uh, Honeywell uh, magnetometers, analog devices, MEMS, 32-bit uh, megabit SD micro flash, and we have a 22 microamp hour lithium poly battery in there. And that's the dimensions. And uh, all subsystems and processor controls is sensor sensitivity and power saving, et cetera. Okay. And um, as I said previously, we have, a, um, we have two radio MAC layers. One of is a CSMA1 and also a TDMA1 as well. And that's the one that you saw previously um, that was exhibited. And um, traditional methods for doing this kind of thing is either um, using cameras, for instance. You know, if you want to be able to, you have a special suit with balls on it, and you have several cameras. The drawback is that it's an expensive resource. And um, if you have crowded scenes that you're trying to animate, for instance, then you need not just one camera, but uh, five, seven, 11 cameras quite often. And then you need to do a lot of post-processing to stitch all this thing back, OK? Um, whereas with the approach which I've just uh, demonstrated, you can, um, you can animate crowded scenes, for instance, quite easily. No, it's, it's, it's not a problem. And the other way of doing it is that's the vision method. Um, the other one is joint angle sensors, which hinders free movement. It's bulky. You know, that's uh, not a fashion accessory that you have on the right-hand side. So, so the other important factor in our favor is that you can do all the animations in real time, which you can't do with the other methods there. So that brings us, um, as I said, if you want to use existing inertial systems, th those are the two. But this is the first fully wireless, multiple sensor, single receiver system which is available. So that's how it's different. And we've been investigating a number of different applications. I um, wonder what happened there. I'll come back to it. Um, for instance, can you, um, can you track the golf swing of a person? And that's where I'm coming to next. We're using it in physiotherapy, in martial arts, for instance. Can you put this on a person, say on an expert, be able to capture the information, and then put it on a novice, a student, who repeats the same gestures? And remember, all these things are being done concurrently. And then can you do a comparison between an expert's gesture and expert's movements, for instance, or a string of movements, and that of the novice, and be able to highlight the differences and actually give you feedback and as to which ones to improve, as it were. Um, so. And you can go one step further and connect this to uh, something called Motion Builder, which is an animation uh, sort of engine, and in real time be able to move these things around. So I will show you some of these next. Um, so this is the, the human golf one, which is less well developed. We are working on this is an ongoing one, which is we're working on this at the moment. And, and this has been stored and is being replayed at, uh, at a slower speed. So as you can see, that it's only in the upper arm. We didn't put any sensors on the, the lower part of the body. Um, so you, you can track the, the movement of the, you can actually characterize the golf swing. And if you can characterize the golf swing, then what you can then start doing is being able to compare the golf swing with that of an expert and seeing where the differences are. And so how far is your golf swing from the ideal, as it were? And remember, you can do this. It's just infrastructureless. You can do this in the golf course. You don't need cameras. You don't need any else. So it's infrastructureless. That's the, that's the beauty of this approach. 
And then uh, I was going to show you um, things like um, you can connect this to a to an to an animation engine, and um, then again in real time you can start doing things like these. So you have a character, and then you're moving your hands around, moving your legs around, and the character changes. And then you can have your avatar, and then you can give it uh, you can give it certain movement features. Or going still further, because you can do this in real time, you can have network real-time games. So you're talking to games companies and uh, animation companies so that they can use these kinds of uh, these kinds of devices. So what you have there is wireless sensor networks, but operating in a highly disruptive mode, because what you can now do is to give the power, as it were, in the hands of the animators, the hands of the games. You don't need to go out and, uh, and uh, hire studio time, which can be quite expensive. So think in terms of printing um, a few years back, um, where you didn't need a typesetter, you don't need a, a master printer, as it were. You give the power in the hands of the layman, as it were. So you're banalizing technology, and you're doing this for, for animation, as it were, um, that kind of kind of industry. So that's why it's, it's, it's disruptive. And the future work in this area is, if you were to put this in the person, can you perform certain movements and be able to auto-calibrate by using the sensor information and having certain model about the human body as to what is connected to what, as it were. What are the degrees of freedom that you have? So there is a certain um, inbuilt model, and how can you, um, how can you actually um, learn something about the, the various uh, the degrees of freedom that you have, et cetera, so that you build the model of the person rather than programming it explicitly. So, so that is the way we are moving forward there. And, um, and the long term is device miniaturization. We're looking at ways in which we can get these, um, these three sets of sensors into something which is small enough that you can put it on a ring on your fingers so that you can have a network of these on your fingers and then I can... Um, then you can sign read, uh, read sign languages, etc. You know, in real time, as it were. So, the, the sort of moving in that direction, and having multi-channel radio, etc. So, so that's the distance. So, in order to achieve this, you need. I hope I have kind of uh, been able to make a case that what you need is various disciplines coming together. It's not just electronic engineers. It's not just device physicists. It's not just chemists looking at radios, and not just computer scientists looking at uh, the various networking and programming layers, etc. But really, what is the optimal design that you can come up with? How do the various subsystems within each of these specs interact with each other? Any design decisions that you make on one part of the subsystem, how does it impinge on other parts of the subsystem? So that in order to design an effective system, given the, given the lack of resources that you have there, you need to be able to use the storage, which could be as low as eight kilobytes of RAM. You know, when I say this, tell this to the students, they throw their hands up. You know, people are very lazy when it comes to memory. You know, memory is free. That's the thing, the term that is used. It's not when you're trying to do something like this. If you talk to old people like me, you know, memory wasn't free in our days. You had to use that very, very sort of uh, judiciously. So you're learning new or relearning the old tricks, as it were. As it were. So it's bringing together these various uh, skill sets. And in order to do this, you, know, you need to be able to have the experts in programmable networks working with people who are designing the radio, working with uh, people who are doing photonics, working with, uh, uh, we're, we're thinking of using solar cells, batteries, uh, sorry, solar cells to, to scavenge. Um, what would be wonderful if you could have be able to scavenge from movements, etc. You know, you can talk to Paul Wright about that. Or designing new batteries, new materials for these batteries. So we have electrochemists working on that, looking at how do you extract these um, these these very tiny signals from very noisy environments. You know, should you use UWB? Should you look at other ways of doing this? Processor design. It's a distributed computing platform. There are all these issues, 
and of course demonstrators, being able to have compelling demonstrators where you can actually use this technology for real and deploy them. So it's also very these coming together. So drilling down one layer just to show you, so that's the spec architecture. So this photonics is being done in the physics department at St. Andrews University along with the, uh, with the battery, the processor at Edinburgh, the, the radio at Glasgow. Sensors, we get them off the shelf. We're not doing sh sensors research per se. The physical layer from Strathclyde and the integration takes place at Edinburgh and all the other takes place in my group at Edinburgh, the networking protocol, the distributed computing harness and program environments. So it's bringing the skill sets within one umbrella, as it were. That's, that's, that's important because you want to, in, in these highly resource-constrained systems, you want to understand how decisions made at one level impinge at the other level, both vertically as well as horizontally. Okay? So you need to understand these things, and you can only do that when you're working with someone who's doing the other part of the site. So I'll skip this, saying that we have 26 people working on this full-time um, until 2010. That's the funding that we have from, our, from the Research Council. I'll skip all this. Um, okay, so what I've given you is a, is a background that's kind of justified as to why is this different? Why is this just not um, sensor network research as we know it? What are the issues that you need to tackle in the future? So, so I, I've kind of, I hope I've made a case for that. What I'm going to do next is to pick out two um, sort of research and go through this very quickly. Um, one is at the algorithmic level, and the other one is lower down at the Mac layer, and um, sort of give you some idea of the, of the work that we're doing um, in that layer. So location discovery. Why is this important? It's important because given a network, a wireless network of this sort, and you're sensing in data, um, you want to put some spatial coordinates, as it were, on the data that you, are, that you are sensing. You might not want to know the exact location of, the, uh, of where the data is being sensed, but you want to know the relative location, the logical location, uh, who am I next to, as it were? And this could change over time, because what can happen is, remember that we have mobility as one of the attributes of our system. So you can have the system uh, moving around. So over time, you would need to update this information, as it were. Okay? And you want to do it in a way, because if you go back, one of the attributes of the system is you want it to be decentralized, um, we want it to be fault-tolerant, and you want it to be infrastructureless. So you can't have... Um, you can't have beacons, etc., or you can't even have GPS because, in a sense, there is an infrastructure. Okay, how can you do it in the lack of these things? And, in other words, the approach that you have depends only on the available information that you get from the specs themselves. So, can we do this by, uh, by looking at the connectivity information? We know that um, in a network of this sort, the specs have only a list of their one hot neighbors. Okay. Who are my neighbors? Who can I hear as a fair? And network links imply constraints on the physical layout as a fair. And can we, if we were to combine enough such constraints, can we come up with a probable location of this? So essentially what this is is a, a distributed relaxation algorithm which runs on each of these specs. And the other thing we wanted to make sure is that all the specs are homogeneous. That is the same algorithm runs on each one. In other words, all specs are equal. You know? Some are not more equal than others. As a fair, you know? They're all equal. So can we do this in this fashion? And we call it the crystal growth, growth algorithm for obvious reasons. A spec that knows its location implies constraints in the location of neighboring specs. What it means is that if you have a one-hop neighbor, it must be within radio range. If you have two-hop neighbors, you're probably outside the radio range. Okay. You're not using RSSI. You're using some binary information, as it were. Okay. In the slides, um, which I have after this, you would see a round circle. In practice, radio transmission is never spherical. Okay. But for the sake of um, drawing those pictures, I put them in. We have both round ones. We also have all kinds of arbitrary, not arbitrary shapes, but the kind of shapes that you get when you have radio transmissions. 
So once an unlocated spec has enough constraints, that is, it can commit to a location and in turn imply new constraints on its neighbors. Okay? So um, that's what you have. Um, in this case, I'm within radio range. This is outside the radio range of that. That is outside the radio range of this. So in a sense, that will be there in the intersection between these two spheres. But as I said before, it doesn't need to be spherical. And if you have enough numbers of these things, uh, of, these, um, uh, of these spheres intersection, then you can sort of locate that uh, far more uh, accurately to be somewhere around that. OK, so you have a relaxation algorithm which runs on each of these specs. And then you need to seed this. And the way we do it is we look for a particular pattern which is mutual ignorance, as it were, like a star. So something like this would be a pattern we look for in the, in the, in, in the network. And we have, done, we have run lots of simulations, et cetera, on these things. And we find that such patterns do exist in a, um, in a random population of these devices. And of course, those patterns, incidence of those patterns increase as the, um, as the, uh, the population of the, of the specs increase as well. And what you can then do is, given these things, we can actually locate uh, the positions of each of these specs. And then what you see here are error bars on this. That is, what is the difference between where you actually are, because in simulations you can do that, you have an oracle as it were, and where the location algorithm thinks it is. Okay, so the longer the bar, uh, less accurate is the location algorithm. So that's what you see um, as a result of a simulation which runs on that. So the strengths of these algorithms are, one, it's decentralized. It works only in connectivity information. Um, the weaknesses are, it, uh, even though we assume that it's not circular, it assumes a certain predictable radio emissions. There are certain bandwidth costs because you are, you are passing messages between each other. And in the 3D case, in the 2D case, it's easy to find those, those uh, mutual ignorance patterns. But in the 3D case, it's less so. Okay. Uh, you can still find them, but uh, it is less so. So I'll just show you this algorithm running in a simulator just to give you a feel for how this works. And what you have here are, um, are three um, sort of blocks, as it were. You have one box and one horizontal block. OK. You have specs on these blocks. And um, what you'll then see is this, uh, these two are stationary. That moves, as it were. And then the idea is, can you locate um, the horizontal bar, the moving bar, over time using the algorithm which I've just described? So let's see what happens when you do this. Um, that's where you see the outline on top. And that's where running the algorithms um, that's where it thinks it is. And the red ones are the error bars. And as you can see, when it comes to this neighbor, the more neighborhood information that it has, the more accurate that it gets. And you would expect that you know, because of the, the algorithm, the, the more circles, intersections that you have, uh, um, narrower is the, the location that you can come up with. So the message to take away from this is here's an algorithm which is fully decentralized. It doesn't use any other information, such as sensor-based information, et cetera. And it's leaderless. And it doesn't use any infrastructure, uh, such as beacons, et cetera. OK. Um, but if you were to use sensors, and for instance, if the specs can detect the direction of an incoming transmission, which is fairly easy to do, for, for instance, if you have an optical system coupled with this, or specs can detect their own orientation. Think of Orient 2, where it has orientation in there. And if you have sensory data coming in, which can be done with an accelerometer and magnetometers, then what happens then is specs periodically broadcast their own positions. Specs thus build a list of line segments from received broadcasts. And the specs locations compute as the average of the intersection of each pair of line segments. And when you do that, the performance improves dramatically, for instance. So previously you had all those error bars, and now you have long there. Okay. So previously, you saw without any um, external information, think of the sensors being external information. But if your kind of application is such that you need these 
uh, sensory data as in motion tracking, etc., then this is a, a useful side effect that you have that you can use for free. And the, and the s summary of this algorithm is that it's strength sites, decentralized, minimal bandwidth, works in 3D, does not rely on predictable radio admission, is tolerant to error in sense directions. The re weakness, of course, is it requires additional hardware. But then if you, can, if you need that kind of accuracy, then and it's, uh, something has to give, as it were. And we have a simulator called Spexim, which is Java-based. Um, it does algorithmic level simulations. It, act, um, it looks something like this. It's, so I will skip all that and then go on to the, the last section of the talk. And I promise that I will have one other example than this, which is the fire detection examples. An example of a, um, again, of a fully, uh, so let me come back to this, a fully decentralized leaderless algorithm which runs this. And the idea here is the following, that um, you're in a building and um, you, have these, uh, you have these devices on the ceiling. Sensors, it has carbon monoxide sensors, smoke detectors, detectors etc. And what you want it to do is that in the event of a fire, you should be able to detect the fire and then show your path away from the fire, should such a path exist, and find the shortest path, as it were and be able to do it in a fully decentralized way. Even if some of them went down, you can still carry on, as it were. So we've implemented this, and we're actually in the process of deploying this sort of 100 specs, as it were, in a building. But I will show you a, a smaller example of this um, in the lab, which is, um, which is a linear array in this case. That's the fire. Um, and then it sort of senses it, and it shows you a path away from from this. Um, although this is a very simple example here, we can actually run this at least in simulations in quite complex uh, buildings. And, you can and these fires um, can pop up at different times, and you should be able to navigate around that. So we have algorithms to do that. And uh, as I said, we are deploying this on, on hundreds of specs, as it were, in a building, um, in the building that we live in at the moment. Um, where, where our department is based. Um, again, as you can see here, it's uh, local information, local processing. There is no global communication. The only extra information that you need is to annotate the specs at the exits because you need to know which of there are the exits. So that's the only thing to, to provide. Um, other than that, um, you can deploy a deployment as it were. OK. OK, right. So I was going to talk about SmackMac. Um, what I'm following is that uh, the Berkeley Mac, in some sense, is, is the de facto standard, as it were, for Mac for wireless sense networks, or has been for some time. And um, we developed um, a Mac called SpecMac. Um, which actually improves on Berkeley Mac for the, for the localization algorithm which I showed you before. Because that, so you need to be able to compare this on, for a given algorithm. You know, how, do, how do these two perform? And using batteries, you have a, a lithium-ion batteries and a Sanyo button cell, which is quite small. And we ran this on the real devices using the real batteries and made measurements of battery lifetime. There is a the, the, all these things are published, so that's the, that's the reference for that. Um, very quickly, in the case of the Berkeley Mac, what, what happens is that you have a preamble and then you have the data. In um, the case of SpecMac, what we do is we have retransmissions that we, um, let, let me sort of see. We use redundant retransmissions instead of a long preamble. And the case of SpecMag back off, as it's called, it sends wake up packets. SpecMag data it sends actual data packets. So that's, that's, that's the intuition behind this. Um, can I, I can actually go to the results. So, case, um, what is the lifetime for a given uh, for a localization algorithm running on this, for a given battery running on real devices? Um, that's the improvement over, um, of BMAC 
not having any MAC at all. And that's the improvement in spec MAC B and spec MAC D. And this is the calculate, this is the improvement over B MAC. That's a calculated because we have uh, analytical models of this as well. So that's 38% better than for using the larger batteries and uh, to show you that it really, um, and then we can run the same thing on, on coin cells. And the improvement here is considerable in the sense that that's 83% better than BMAC and that, that is 117% better than BMAC. So th these are non-trivial improvements, as you can see. So, um, so that's been uh, patented, and, uh, and there's a lot of interest in, 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 this, in this MAC that can be used for any ad hoc wireless sensor network applications, not just the, the kinds that uh, we're looking at here. Something which is of great interest to me, which is... Um, can you use the kind of sensing platforms that I've talked about in its larger version, but also in its miniature version that we are, that we are designing and be able to control swarms of robots, for instance? And I know there's, I was speaking to some of the researchers this morning, there's excellent work going on in that area here, and there could be uh, some interesting things that one can do um, in there, or even if you have um, swarms of these things flying, and we do some of this ourselves. Um, that's not a UAV. That's that's a real glider because we have some gliding enthusiasts in our in our group. So we take it up and then try and recreate the the the, the maneuvers and orientation using the the Orient two spec that I told you before, along with the GPS in this case. Um, so just to give you a bigger picture, um, what we, we also do a lot of research, which I haven't covered here, on the architecture of the specs and the system level in integration of the miniature 5 cube energy sources, both battery and renewable sources, um, resource constrained network services for hubless transient network of specs, programming environments, and distributed algorithms. And you saw a sample of that just now. And, um, and there is scope for collaborative uh, sort of development, and uh, and one such, um, especially in the area of being able to um, combine both sensing and actuation, is design frameworks, for instance, for fine-grained asynchronous network sensor and actuator systems, very importantly in unreliable and uncertain environments. You know, um, at the moment we are in this. Total least um, if you want to simulate and understand what's happening and be able to model the two-way interaction of the system with the environment where you close the loop. And what is the impact of various design, design decisions that you make and optimization of the different levels of abstraction and performance? Um, you know, how do the decisions that you make impact on the architectural level, for instance, if you constrain the resources um, in the operating system, if you're using different scheduling protocols, the MAC layer, for instance, and the various networking protocols that we have. Okay, trying to understand in a systematic way the interaction between the various levels is still an open problem, and you know, there could be scope for collaborative developments on that. So in conclusion, more minutes according to this clock, done is I've outlined the vision of spectral computing and how we are sort of looking beyond traditional sense of wireless sensor networks as we know it. And these are fine-grained distributed platforms built on a substrate of miniature ad hoc wireless networks. And what this opens up is whole new possibilities, whole new classes of problems that you can open up given the sizes of these things. At the same time, I've also given you a flavor for the, the problems that you need to solve before you get there. So, it's a great area of research for, for grad students who are either starting a research or, or building a career, as it were. And in particular, the decentralized, leaderless distributed algorithms for scalability and gracious degradation. I think that's important. I think people pay a lot of lip service to that. They say, yes, you know, we want to do that. But after doing it and getting down to it and seeing the problems that you encounter, unless you do it, you know, it's, it's, it's not just doing it in simulation, but actually running them on real devices and seeing the outcome 
of your of your of the algorithms is extremely important. And what we really need is crying out for this is a design environment for closed loop there are lots of adjectives here, but you can read it. Closed loop, asynchronous, fine grained, wireless, sense actuated. Arvin's going to be on campus all day tomorrow. For example, he's meeting Joel uh, Wilson in uh, mechanical engineering at 1 o'clock, 3 o'clock? I can't remember. Do you have some other time tomorrow, a couple of open slots, I believe. Right? I'm meeting the, the robot people, the flying robot people who I met this morning briefly. I think they're in the audience somewhere. Good. Um, but but, but let me just, we'll, we'll uh, have a couple I of... I don't know, but uh, I'm meeting them at different yeah. times. But I'm just going to say, if, you, if, you need to, if you'd like to meet Professor Arvin, please send me an email and I can set it up uh, with him. You know, we're, we're close friends, we have uh, contact numbers too. Um, some questions. Professor Shankar Sastry, our fearless leader. Yes. So, uh, I, I agree with your concerns about the BMAC. Uh, the, our reservations of the BMAC are somewhat uh, are additional behind the power consumption. So, you know, in all these concurrency intensive applications like closing the loop and so on and so forth, uh, guaranteed timing for the delivery of packets is critical. So my concern about your Mac is that if I then asked you whether you could prove to me that packets would be received with 99% success within a time period capital T, I think it would be hard to analyze that. I do agree with that. That's why the Mac that you use is dependent very much on the kinds of applications and the attributes of the applications. There are certain applications where um, reliability, you need to have triple nine or four nine reliability, as it were. And in those cases, I wouldn't use this kind of protocol. And the reason I wouldn't use this kind of, I wouldn't use Just, this. You, you wouldn't use the protocol. So I, I don't know if you met Chris Pisa. Of course, the Dust I met him this Inc. morning. The Dust Inc. philosophy is that since timing is everything, he has this uh, protocol called uh, TSMP, Time Synchronized Gobbly Group Protocol. I, I hope he's not here. So TMS. Is anybody in the audience who knows? Time Synchronized Mesh Protocol. And, and okay. the advantage of that, of course, is that you know if he'll tell you within some probability that packet will arrive sure. in so many seconds. I agree. We we have variants of TDMA protocols for mesh networks, and um, uh, it was before you were here, but I showed an example of uh, having a 15 node devices in the human body where you sort of move the arms around. That one uses a variant of the TDMA uh, protocol in there, um, whereas these are for different classes of applications where it's ad hoc, wireless, mobile, and things of that sort. Th where these are very good You expect questions. packets to be dropped. Yeah. Yes. Good question, Shankar. Andy, Professor Packard. Just on the uh, 15 mm -hmm. node. Experiment. What I didn't understand is what was being computed at the nodes. I mean, obviously, it was finally being displayed. So right. There was a computer at the end. Mm -hmm. What was that ultimately receiving? To what extent was that uh, uh, estimating from the data? What, what was. Okay, so you're getting three sets of data there um, the data from the accelerometer, from the gyro, and the magnetometers. That's so locally what's happening. That's what is happening locally. So, in essence, what is happening locally is the is the positions of, uh, of, of, of the devices and updated over time. So you're just getting summaries of information, which in this case is, uh, is being sent to the, um, to the so base the station here. the display was just displaying Absolutely. positions? Display is just displaying integrating. positions. integrating? No, it's not. That and that is important because that isn't the philosophy of speculative right. computing, right. is to push everything to the edges. Yeah. And what is being sent out to the outside world is just summaries of information rather than just data. Yeah, that's a good example of uh, yeah. ledgers, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, Ruzbe Jafari, I'm doing a one-year postdoc here. Um, did you encounter any problems with, with the battery? And if yes, what was the major source of battery consumption? Which battery are we talking the about? The batteries that you have on the notes. Okay. So In the case, I, I, can, I can give you some figures for the or the, uh, for the particular. So I guess the question was, uh, what was the lifetime, uh, the battery lifetime for the node? For how long could you deploy it? Okay, so 
Okay, let, let, let me answer that. So the, for the example that you have in the human body, for instance, which has no optimizations whatsoever, and uh, you, you are transmitting, so, so there's no duty cycling whatsoever. Uh, there is no optimization. It's just the raw thing. It runs for two hours, 40 minutes, um, which is pretty good when you think about it. For the class of applications that we are looking at and you're, and you're sending data all the time, and that can be improved, of course, with duty cycling, et cetera. But in this particular example, um, you want to do things in real time and you want to be able to move things around. But we know that we can perform improvements on that, and we're working yeah. on that at the moment. Yes. One more closing question. We're running a little late from our traditional time. By the way, look at uh, one of the slides has uh, DK's email address, too. I'm, I'm here for two days, um, although I'll be coming back over the next year. Every two months, I'm hoping to be here for at least 10 to 14 days. So I'm in Shankar Shastri's office in Corey Hall. What's the number? 514. So if you want to meet me, just either send me an email or just come along or drop a note and I'll get back to you. Uh, so my question is, if you were to produce these uh, devices industrially, what would be the cost per, um, per unit? Okay. Um, I can't tell you what would be the cost per unit if you were to uh, do this industrially. When you say industrially, what you mean is that uh, there will be a certain economy of scale and things of that sort. Um, but at the moment, that costs 500 pounds per thing. So in terms of real money, it's about uh, $950 each. Almost. <coughs> Hi. Uh, so y you show the uh, the error bars with the um, the crystal growth method, mm -hmm. and then the the improved method with the smaller error bars. Yes. And I believe you said that was the node's own confidence in its position. Um, Is that true? It's not just a confidence. It's it's the actual. It's a factual. Oh, it's the factual error. Factual error, yes. Oh, okay. Confidence okay. implies that there is a. Okay, it, it is right. a factual error. It's oh, a difference okay. between where it actually is and where it thinks it is. Although confidence is. is. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to close this up there. It's a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. That was really mm. Thanks. Please keep in touch with DK.